Good morning, everybody. Um, or, or good afternoon, good evening. You could even be watching this in the middle of the night. Who knows? Well, the wonders of the digital age. Um, my name's Christopher. I'm going to give you a little talk on alien invasive plant species that you're likely to find in your travels around Ireland. The travels might be a little limited um, at the moment, thanks to, thanks to COVID. So, you know, stay safe. Stay within your five kilometres. <laughs> Unless you're watching this after then, then we'll go wherever you want. Uh, so, so yeah, look, let's get into things. Hope you all have our tea or our coffee. Uh, you know, I have my little spinach smoothie here. That's rough. <clears throat> uh, all right, so let, um, over the next 20 or 30 minutes-ish, I'll give you a little introduction uh, on who I am, what I do, um, what makes an alien species, what makes an invasive species, Sometimes it's one, not the other. Sometimes it's both. We'll go through some common invasive species that you're likely to find in Ireland, the, the not-so-bad ones and then the more serious guys, and then uh, the, the bread and butter, you know, Japanese knotweed. Ooh, it's the one we all hear about. And then we'll have a little note on uh, aquatic invasive plant species, um, and then we'll get to the end on and kind of what can we do, what action can we take against invasive species to stop this alien threat. Um, and then in the, uh, in, in the live uh, webinar, uh, out of question section, obviously you can't do questions with uh, a recording, so I'll leave my email at the end. And if you have any any queries or want further information or clarification, please do not hesitate to uh, to let me know. And uh, yeah, look, I, I'm aware that this this little box here is uh, obscuring this slide, but I think it's the only one that's going to be affected by it, um, so it shouldn't really be an issue. So who am I? My name is Christopher. I'm from the south of Ireland. Um, I grew up there. I, I studied plant biology there down in, in University College Cork, where I kind of started to specialise into ecology. You know, moving away from just plants on their own into, into habitats, how they interact with surrounding mammals, amphibians, you know, fish, the whole package. It's pretty good. Um, and now I work with an environmental consultancy called Flynn Fernie. Um, uh, they're based down in Cork, but we work all over Ireland. A lot of kind of habitat surveys for um, construction, development, things like greenways. Um, it, it's pretty cool. It's a great job, you know, gets you outside. Here's me with a, a, a giant knotweed. This is, it's actually a, a different type of knotweed, it's a Japanese knotweed. There are several knotweeds, believe it or not. This one is, is less common, but it's, it's still around and it's just as invasive as Japanese cotton. So, alien and invasive species. Um, what makes them? Here is my favourite uh, alien species, the, the humble potato. So, so not all aliens are invasive though. Uh, an alien species is just, it's any species that is outside of its natural range. For example, the potato, it's from Peru and Bolivia, and yet it's cultivated widely here in Ireland. Like if, if, if you just left a field of potatoes go, it wouldn't start to take over the countryside, so it's not really invasive. Invasive usually implies that there's some sort of harm or displacement of other species. Um, and it's just usually negative associations with, with invasive species. But the, the thing is, like, a, an alien species is, is outside of its, its natural range. How did it get there? There's, there's a couple of ways of spread. Very, very rarely they'll spread naturally. There's a type of bean that, uh, that lives in the rainforests in, in uh, South, South America. And it drops off these little pods. They can float down the river all the way out to the sea, and they've actually crossed the Pacific or the Pacific Ocean, and have been found in some of the Pacific Islands. But cases like that are few and far between. The majority of times, alien species are spread by us, um, and it can be accidental or intentional. For example, these two fellows here, this uh, this ugly guy above me is the cane toad. So he's native to South America and was introduced into Australia to control a type of beetle that eats, uh, I think it eats sugarcane. And so the idea was, oh, you know, well, look, we'll bring in the cane toad, it'll eat all the beetles, and then problem solved. What actually happened was they brought in the cane toad, it took no interest in the beetles, and it spread like wildfire. Now, cane toad is about this big, and it'll eat anything smaller than it. Um, even anything the same size as it, they'll even eat other cane toads. <laughs> and so there's now, I think, one and a half billion of them in Australia, in the north and the, the western, or north and east. Uh, it's, it's a huge problem, and they're, because they're not native, other, other species don't know how to escape them, they're not evolved to deal with them, uh, and they're also poisonous, so predators won't even go near them. Um, this other little guy to the, to the left here is a, a brown tree snake, <coughs> excuse me, who was introduced into Guam, uh, 
by American troop transport. So the planes would, would leave a neighboring island where there were snakes, land down in Guam where there were no snakes, and, and similar to, to the dodos, you know, who had no idea what humans looked like. You know, they're like, hello, you can walk up, hit them on the head, take them home for dinner. The, the birds on Guam have no idea what a snake is, so they'll just wave it as it comes up and, and eats them. And they've absolutely devastated the, the population of, of native, um, native birds there. Somebody at some point suggested introducing the cane toad to try and eat the snakes, um, and thank God somebody vetoed that idea because it would have been absolutely disastrous. Um, and look, as illustrated, uh, invasive species are, are a really big problem in terms of uh, suppressing and displacing native species. I mean, in the case of animals, quite often you have predation, so they'll, they'll eat native species, but in the case of plants, quite often it's, uh, it's to do with um, overcompetition. So they'll, they'll kind of pop into a habitat and they'll, they'll push everybody out because they're, they're so well adapted. Um, so some common invasives that you're, you're going to see in Ireland, again, these are the, the not so bad ones. Um, any, any gardeners among you might, uh, might rec recognize this. It's called butterfly bush, also known as Budlia, Budlia davidii. It's from central China and Japan. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of, uh, a lot of the invasive species are, are going to come from warmer countries, um, particular, particularly Asia, um, and, and they're introduced as ornamentals. So they're quite bright and colourful and striking, and you'll see that pattern as, as we move through the, the talk. The problem with butterfly bush is, is that overcompetition again. It, it's able to grow really quickly because it's used to harsher climates than Ireland. So when it comes here, it's like it's on holiday, it just takes off. Um, it's a bit of a pain to remove because it, it produces thousands of seeds that are dispersed by the wind, and if one of those lands on top of a building, it'll, it'll get into it, it'll get into the grouting, it'll get into even like old concrete, and it, it can grow almost anywhere. You, you, I'm sure you've seen it around the place, like in, on old buildings that might be halfway up or on a derelict construction site. So it's a bit of a pain to remove, you know, you have to get into awkward places. It grows really quickly. Um, it's, it's good for butterflies though. It's an important source of, uh, of nectar for them. So, you know, silver linings. Next up we have the winter heliotrope. This guy you'll see quite often on, uh, on roadsides, especially in the south. Um, so we're coming into, into spring now, so the flowers are starting to die off, and it gets its name for the flower that forms in the winter, this, this beautiful purple flower. Um, well, I think it's beautiful anyway. Uh, it, it's, it's characterized by these, these big lily-shaped leaves, and this guy actually doesn't come from too far away. It's from more Mediterranean Europe. What's happened here is that it exploits a similar niche for, for similar species. So natively we have a plant called colt's foot here, or, or butterbur. They're, they're quite similarly related, so that niche exists in our habitat. So the winter heliotrope came in and it's like, ooh, grand, my cousins live here, then I can live here. This one doesn't really push other plants aside, but what happens is, is it forms these really dense carpets on disturbed ground. That's why often you see them on, on roadsides. You make a road, you pile all the soil at the side, and then there's a little bit of material from heliotrope, and it just comes in, creates a, creates a carpet. And you can kind of see it in this picture that all the leaves are so squashed together that they block out all the light underneath, and so nothing can really grow up. Uh, um, snowberries are... actually, these ones were kind of new to me. I hadn't really heard of them before I, before I started work. Um, again, this one's from uh, North and Central America. Um, I'm going to actually start eating my words because I think only a couple of these on this slide are from uh, Asia. Um, these got these, these really um, striking white berries. You can see it really clearly in this picture, but when you're, when you're out and about, you'll often see them at the edges of the roads, about a, about a meter, two meters high, and just like, it's like looking into the night sky. It's just dotted with all these little white spots. Um, again, like winter heliotrope, it, it grows quite densely, and so it blocks the light. It overcompetes, it grows quite quickly. So nothing can really grow up underneath, and when it dies back in, in the winter, it, it creates these really bare, exposed banks. Um, and there's no understory, there's no kind of field layer, as it's called, to, to hold that soil together. And, and so the wind will come along and it'll dry it and it'll strip it away. Uh, poisonous to humans, so don't eat them. They look really tasty, but really bad idea. I think they are an important source of food for game birds, though, like, uh, like pheasants. So, again, silver linings. Cherry laurel. Um, a lot of people didn't know that this is, this is invasive. Um, and it, it's, not, 
it's not like as, as openly aggressive as, as Japanese knotweed, but uh, it's, it's a little bit more insidious purely because of its nature. So it's one of the few evergreen deciduous plants. Um, again, it's not from too far away, the Black Sea, uh, not from Asia. <laughs> um, so during the winter, when a native deciduous trees slow down and stop growing, the cherry dara will keep going. And so it's able to continuously grow year after year, whereas other plants stop and start and stop and start. So it really takes advantage of those colder months. And so what you see is it, it comes up under other trees and it'll, it'll spread out. And you often see it in like estates and, and, and woodlands where it's, it's, it's blocked light, it's, it's kind of crept its way up and it's taken over the canopy. It's, it's more of a problem in woodlands than out and about. Um, and look, it, it's, you don't need to go and chop down your, your cherry laurel hedging if you have some. Like it, it's fine. It's, it's, uh, it's only when it gets into a natural setting that it can cause problems over time. It's, it's okay in, in domestic environments. It's, uh, it's spread mostly by birds as well. Those, those little kind of cherry fruits, birds love them, fly around, spread the seeds. So unfortunately, this is one of the ones that's like, it's, it's here to stay, you know, the, the seeds are everywhere. Um, it won't be going anytime soon. Uh, so this brings us to our third schedule, invasive plant species. There's, there's a, list of, uh, a list of the most wanted <laughs> plants in, in Ireland. So these are the ones we actively have to work against to, to remove um, when we can. And they're, they're the very bad ones. So first up, um, this one will be very familiar to anybody who's been around uh, Killarney National Park. This Rhododendron ponticum, um, it's from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, so you know, Spain and Portugal. And interestingly enough, it is endangered there. It's a protected species. So the story is that uh, it's, it's used to growing in these dry, arid environments, you know, lots of very little kind of ground cover. So it's, it's really hot, like the water evaporates. Um, and so it's, it's used to just struggling and getting by in this, this harsh environment. And then it comes to Ireland, where it's kind of mild and there's lots of water, and it's like, oh, brilliant! So it absolutely takes off like fire. And you get this really strong overcompetition uh, because it, it grows so quickly and it's so dense, it forms these, these really thick canopies. It's like an umbrella, it's so dark underneath them. I think a couple of years ago, there was uh, some tourists that got lost in Killarney National Park for hours in the rhododendron forests. And in the same way that humans, you know, can't find their way and can't see, you know, neither can other plants. So once these form, you know, it's nothing is getting up underneath them. There's just not enough light. Um, and the problem is when you cut them back, they, they start to come again and the seeds will come up through the ground. But let's say you, you come into a rhododendron forest and you completely cut everything back all the way down to the ground. What happens is you get a mixed regeneration. So the native trees, like the oaks and all, will, will start to come up. But so will the rhododendron. But because they're not native, uh, local herbivores like deer will come in and they will eat all of the, the native saplings, but they'll leave the rhododendron. So it's, it's the kind of thing you have to come back year after year after year and just make sure that like every sapling is cut up because even a couple will, will start to spread again. And like you, you can see in this picture here, it's, it's so thick. And if you haven't been to Killarney, head there. Um, a, it's beautiful. But B, just, just to see how vast the rhododendron has, has spread. Uh, also, toxic to bees. Um, some bees, not all bees. Uh, as if the poor bees didn't have enough to worry about. Uh, if, they, if they eat the nectar of the rhododendron, it makes them really sick. So, you know, poor bees. Next we have the, the ice plant. Uh, it was formerly known as the Hottentot fig, although Hottentot is, is kind of a not politically correct term anymore. It was a bit of a derogatory term for... Um, indigenous South African peoples by uh, colonizers. So we're kind of moving away from that one. Um, but look, similar to those indigenous people, it's from South Africa. Uh, and again, we've got an overcompeter here, forms dense carpets like um, the winter heliotrope, except this one is more um, in coastal areas. And it's got these these thick uh, kind of three-sided leaves. They're it's like almost like a succulent. And, uh, and you can see the flower here. It's, it's very nice. Um, it forms, like this, this picture forms these vast monocultures, it spreads out, it stops anything else coming in. Um, a, a, a positive is that it is an important food source for the black rat, but unfortunately the black rat is also an invasive. So, you know. 
Ah, this is one of my favorites, Jen Rhubarb. Um, so I, I'm from Wexford. I think uh, this is this talk is for a Wexford tail walking club. And so if you've ever been around the Johnstown Castle area, or the Johnstown Estate, you'll see a load of this, this gunnera, giant rhubarb around the place. Um, it's from Chile. It is a similar invasive cousin called Argentinian rhubarb, who's not as prevalent here in Ireland. Um, so the, the Chilean rhubarb, or giant rhubarb, or gunnera, is, is the big bad here, especially up around Ackle Island. It is taken over there, and it's causing huge problems. So, so like some of the others, it blocks a lot of light. You can see in the picture here, it's nice and bright above, but underneath it's quite dark. Um, and it's not pitch black, but even even that kind of reduction in, in light intensity causes a big problem to, to plants. Um, it, it has millions of seeds. You can see the, the seed cone on this side. Maybe it's this side. One of my sides. There's this big floral spike. Um, and these millions of seeds get dispersed into the water and they just get everywhere. Um, and so you often see it on the sides of, uh, the sides of lakes and the sides of water courses because that's the predominant way that it spreads. It also has these rhizomes um, and rhizomes are, think about them like roots that grow along the surface of the ground. It's like a stem that's just kind of snaking along. Um, and rhizomes are an important feature when we get to, to other species later on. So remember what a rhizome is. It's an above ground root. So these, these rhizomes for, for gunnera are they're quite thick and hairy and tubular. Um, and because they're so cylindrical, they actually almost act like a wheel. So every so often one will, will kind of break off. The same way like a gecko loses its tail, it can kind of like constrict older parts of, of the rhizomes and they'll 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 snap if it's if it's windy or if it's rainy, they'll just kind of wash away and then roll downhill. And usually at the bottom of a downhill, you'll find a watercourse. Um, and so they pop into the river, then they float like a little raft uh, until they get deposited somewhere downstream. And then they put down their own roots and gunner grows again. It's this kind of cycle of, of spreading. Um, so if you see, it very, it's very uncommon to see just one stand of it by a lake, for example, or along a river. Quite often you'll see it uh, in multiple spots. Um, down in Cork, for example, on the River Lee. You can actually see where the gunnera starts. You can just keep walking along, and every so often on both sides of the river, there'll just be these little stands that just pop up, like a big patch of rhubarb. Um, unfortunately, this one isn't as nice as rhubarb. It's quite poisonous, so don't eat it. Uh, also, the, the rhizomes can block waterways. They can block uh, like little little streams. They can they can back up rivers, uh, drains. So it's a problem for for humans as well as um, kind of local habitat. Himalayan balsam. Uh, another gorgeous plant. Uh, it's got very long uh, spear spear shaped leaves and uh, bright pink flowers. It's it's perennial, so it dies back in the winter and comes back in the springs and summers from the Himalayas. So yes, another one from Asia. Um, not to be throwing Asia under the bus here. It's just I made a statement at the start, and I'm feeling a bit dumb. <laughs> uh, why is this one bad? It's actually quite interestingly, it has lots of nectar, so it's really, really good for pollinators. And unlike rhododendron, it's not toxic. And initially, that that sounds like, oh, well, surely that's great, you know, more pollinators, more better. Which is true, but the thing is, it's like, what about the other plants that need those pollinators? So it's it's like a little little pollinator comes along, and it's like, oh, I'm hungry, and there's all of this Himalayan balsam. I'll just I'll just go here, um, and it, the other native plants don't get a look in, so they don't get their their seeds um, or pollen dispersed uh, because they're not getting visited as much, if that makes sense. Like the snowberries that end up causing that bit of erosion once once they die back, the Himalayan balsam does the same, but on uh, on the side of a river. It spreads similar to, to gunnera, you know, like a little bit breaks off, or the seeds, the seeds uh, get carried down the river and they, they set up on the side of a bank. They grow these really, really dense stands. Um, I was working on a site down in, in Middleton, and oh my god, it's everywhere. You just keep kind of around a corner, and it's like a, it's like a forest. And they grow really tall as well, up to about two meters. Um, but when, when they die back, all of a sudden, there's nothing holding the bank together. And so uh, any heavy rain event will just come, and it'll just carve out the side of that bank. And not only uh, does, it, does it attribute towards erosion and, and habitat loss, there's a lot of seeds in that ground that are going to get washed downstream. Um, this one only reproduces by seeds. It's not like gunnera where it can it can plant a part of its root and then grow back up again. 
Um, it's got a really cool method of seed dispersal. Um, this this picture, the little black picture here, might be a little bit occluded by uh, by my little my little box, but it's of the seed pods exploding. So what happens is the seeds form inside these little, uh, it's like a mm, almost pear shaped pod, a long pear. And what happens is as the outer skin starts to dry out, more and more tension builds up in the outside until until it's so kind of tightly wound, the slightest touch of like an insect wing will make it pop open and these seeds just shoot everywhere. It's a really cool, really cool way of dispersal. Um, it, I, if you, if you, it's really fun to touch them and just kind of watch them pop and explode everywhere. That being said, it is illegal to aid the spread of an invasive species. So you have been warned, don't, don't pop the, don't pop the balls and pods. Another, another method that the, these guys, uh, cause problems is through this, this thing called allelopathy. This is, is kind of a theory at the moment. It's not 100% uh, confirmed. This is their main way of uh, hurting um, native plants, but they secrete chemicals through, through the soil that inhibit the growth of nearby plants. And you would imagine in their native range, their neighbors are used to dealing with this. It's kind of like an arms race. It's like I evolve a new chemical weapon, you evolve a new chemical defense. And then I involve a new chemical weapon and then you get a new defense. And so you're always kind of keeping on top of each other. So things balance. So in a natural habitat, you, you don't really see monocultures. There's a little bit of everything because everything knows how to, how to kind of fight its quarter. But when you get an invasive species like this, that has all of this chemical weaponry, the natives don't know what to do. And so in, in that way, um, Himalayan balsam and many other species are, are able to outcompete, not only by growing faster but also by being a detriment to to whatever's around them um, and actually and on the topic of chemical weaponry brings us on to, to giant hogweed which is i mean japanese knotweed gets a lot of press but giant hogweed is perhaps the most harmful and dangerous of uh, of all the invasives on on this list it's got a great latin name as well uh, heraclea mantagazianum so fun to say so the problem with this one is um it, it, its sap causes phytophotodermatitis, which means that when it gets on your skin, it deactivates your your natural UV protection. So let's say you're out, you know, hitting through the bush with your stick, you're on a hike, and you get a bit of the sap on your skin, you might not notice it. It's not like an acid. It won't just burn you immediately. It's when you get out into the direct sunlight again that you can get like third degree burns or yeah, third degree, but first degree. Whatever the not worse one is, it's the, the third one. If first is the worst burn, then you get third degree burns, and vice versa. Very serious. You can go to hospital, um, and it can cause lifelong scarring. And it's these really nasty blisters. It's it's very similar to um, many of the other uh, umbellifers or APACA, like like hogweed, fool's parsley, Alexander's. But you'll you'll know it's giant hogweed because it's it's giant, um, like like you can see in this picture, it's it's monstrous. So, but if you're not sure, stay away from it. Look out for these these white umbrella shaped flowers, big kind of leaves, almost like an artichoke. Um, yeah, this one doesn't this one doesn't get enough press, I don't think. So remember, fear the giant hogweed. And on a, on a slightly lighter note, we have. Uh, the American skunk cabbage, which is quite a funny plant because it must smell like a combination of, of old cabbage and, and skunks because it's it's known for its its terrible, terrible smell. Um, it's, it's quite big. This picture doesn't really do it justice, but it can grow up to like a meter, meter tall um, from North America. I've never seen them here in Ireland, but I know, I know they're around. They're somewhere because they've made it onto our third schedule list. Um, its leaves can, can block the light in the same way that other invasives can. This one doesn't grow quite as densely, so it's not like a completely dark canopy. But it's it's still, it's an occlusion of light, which as I mentioned, like even, even a slight decrease in light intensity can inhibit plant growth. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a pretty cool, it's a mad looking plant. Um, and now, here we go, Japanese knotweed. It's the very, very bad plant. You know, you see the signs everywhere. No one's saying, American skunk cabbage, do not cut. So it is from Japan. It is, the Latin name is Fallopia japonica. Um, used to be called Raynautria japonica. Little, little fact there on the nomenclature. 
it was introduced to the Netherlands in 1846, I think, by a Dutch doctor who was living in Japan. And he, he, he sent a couple of bundles of it home, and then he brought some of it home when he came back to his local, like, botanical society. He was like, everybody, look at this amazing plant. It's got these beautiful, gracious white flowers, and it grows with, with great vigor. Um, and he was, like, singing its praises. It's like, oh, it's a, it's a herbal remedy. It's, it's great for bank stabilization. You know, you can feed it to your cattle. It smells nice. It's a lovely ornamental. It's a shade plant. You can use it for game cover. And everyone's like, wow, brilliant. Let's put it everywhere. <laughs> Um, and Betty Bloody ended up regretting that. So it's it's a threat to nature um, because, like the others, it overcrowds and it outcompetes, forms really, really dense stands, um, and it's able to reduce species diversity as a result. So let's say you have your little riparian woodland with a river flowing through. Riparian means to do with the river. Um, little river flowing through your woodland, um, and a little bit of Japanese knotweed ends up in there. And over time it grows, it, it overcompetes with the other plants, it starts to block light, and you end up with a really dense stand of Japanese knotweed. What happens is uh, you get less native pollinators pollinating these native, native plants. So fewer native plants means fewer pollinators. Fewer pollinators means fewer birds. So you can kind of see just by pushing other plants aside, this is able to have kind of a cascading effect. Um, and it's yeah, it forms these, not, not, they're not so much dead zones, I, I don't like the term dead zones in terms of invasive species because they are still alive and it is still full of plant material, um, but somewhat like significantly reduced species diversity. Um, so not, maybe not dead. Uh, and, and like uh, Himalayan balsam, it's a habitat engineer, so it, it you know, puts its roots down into the soil and it can grow quite deep roots, um, that's why it was introduced as bank stabilization. But then uh, what happens is in the winter, the stems die back. And because the stems die back, you've got no ground cover, like the snowberries and the balsam. Uh, the ground can just blow away. It dries out, blows away, or the river and a rain event can wash it away. Um, and so it actually changes. It can widen rivers. It can change landscapes relatively quickly. And, and like, like rhubarb as well, or the giant rhubarb, um, yeah, it can wash bits of the plant down river. They're able to spread very readily and rapidly, um, and, and like a gunner again, it, it uses these rhizomes, these above ground and below ground horizontal stems, um, and they can grow like up to three, seven meters away from the plant. Um, we've never seen them go that far, but it's it's technically possible. So what happens is you have your one plant, and then the rhizome grows out, and then another plant comes up, and then that one puts out its own rhizomes, and more plants come up. Um, it's all to do with this this thing that plants can do called totipotency, and it, it's basically the ability of one cell to become many other cells, and it, it's not the way that you no know, like you know any cell can divide and become two and then become four and then eight. If you think of human stem cells as in this kind of undefined blank slate of a cell that can become a muscle cell or a nerve cell or a fat cell, once it turns into one of those these animal cells. Um, it can't turn back. So it can turn into any cell, but it can't turn back into the blank slate. Plant cells can. So it can become a root cell, and then it can come back to this, uh, what's called a protoplast, that's the blank slate. Or it can become a leaf cell, and then back to the blank slate. And then it can become a root cell again. So what happens is, is if you tear off a plant leaf, and you drop it in like favourable conditions, some of those leaf cells are going to go, hold up a second now, we're not attached to the plant anymore, and there's nice soft wet ground beneath us and there's sunlight above us. Cells at the bottom stop being leaf cells, turn into root cells. Cells at the top stop being leaf cells, turn into stem cells. And so a new plant can grow out of the leaf. Every plant can technically do this, although some are better than others. Japanese knotweed is an absolutely fantastic example of it. Um, but, uh, but because of this, all of them are clones. Because only... A group of, of females uh, plants were introduced into the Netherlands and Japanese knotweed reproduces uh, sexually, not really asexually, or sorry, it can't reproduce sexually because there are only females, so it has to reproduce asexually and only one plant of the ones introduced into the, the Netherlands was introduced into England and all of our knotweed comes from England, so it all can be traced back to this one plant. 
So she's just there kind of spreading a little bit and then that breaks off and moves somewhere else and that spreads again and breaks off and moves somewhere else. So in a way it's, it's not just Japanese knotweed, it's THE Japanese knotweed because there's only one, but they're all clones, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and because of its ability to kind of grow anywhere, uh, it's kind of a problem for us because uh, it, it's, it's, it's a problem for infrastructure mainly. You know, you hear the horror stories of like, oh, a new hotel has been opened and they start to roll back the carpet and it's coming up through, uh, coming up through the floor. And, and yes, it can, it can grow through concrete, it can grow through wood, it can grow through tarmac, but it's not going to push through like a foot of concrete. It's, it's not Superman. It, it normally exploits weaknesses that are already there. So little holes, cracks that develop over time, maybe a bit of rotten wood. Um, but it is, it is still a problem, and as a result, it's illegal to spread it. Um, it's caused many, uh, many kind of legal battles and lawsuits, especially to do with like selling property and devaluing houses, making them unmortgageable in, in the UK. And as a result, it's, it's, it's spawned a lot of media around it. So, you know, removal companies, uh, all the signs up, county councils getting involved. And so it's become a bit of a poster child for invasive species. Don't get me wrong. It's, it is a problem. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, it's, it gets blown up a lot. And treating it is, is quite costly and difficult because, you know, like rhododendron, you have to keep coming back year after year to make sure it's not regrowing. And there's different ways of treating it, um, you know, spraying it with, with herbicide or injecting herbicide down into the stems. You can dig it all up, you can send it away to be heat treated, or you can, you can, you can dig up the plant material and you can bury it so deep that it's never going to see the light of day again. Or you can you can wrap it in a root proof membrane and then bury it underground and hope to God that that it doesn't come back. Um, no, that does stop it. I'm, I'm joking. That will stop it. But look, it's it's costly. It's a lot of work. Um, yeah, it's just a bit of pain. But um, so moving away from from terrestrial terrestrial species to aquatics, um, they're actually in the majority. Surprisingly enough, eighteen of the thirty two plant species on the third schedule which is for invasive species, uh, are, are aquatic. The issue is they're, they're quite hard to identify because, um, you know, we're, we're terrestrial creatures. You know, we're on the land all the time. We're not really in the water that much. And all, okay, to me, a lot of these, these aquatic weeds look the same. I mean, can you tell one weed apart from another one? What if I told you there was like six different plants in this picture? You wouldn't be able to say I'm wrong, would you? <laughs> they're... They're really hard to identify, um, and again, because they're in the water, it's not like we can just start picking them up and, and dealing with them, but they are a problem. So not only can they, they block waterways, uh, they can block pipes, they can tangle up boat propellers, they, they form these dense mats, and like the same thing happens in water as it does on land. They block the light, it makes it really hard for native plant species, aquatic plant species, to grow. Um, yeah, man, jeez, they're a pain. <laughs> Um, but look, and we're not going to be able to pull them all up or dig them all up because if you miss even a little bit of it, it'll just grow back. The thing about algae is that these guys are the bloody masters of total potency. You, you drop a leaf into a, into a pond, and it'll be full of pondweed. Um, there's there's this one uh, species in the Mediterranean, and it is now absolutely everywhere. Um, but it was it was released from a Monaco aquarium. There were like two plants, and they just dropped it. Uh, they, they picked it up, picked up the, the, the glass box, walked to the to the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, tipped it in, and was like, yep, cool, grand. Um, and then a few years later, it is now everywhere in the Mediterranean. So they're pretty hard to deal with. Um, in fact, they're impossible to remove. So we kind of have to observe best practices. So that means if you have any boating equipment in the water, or like kayaks or fishing gear, clean it between... Uh, between moving it between water bodies, um, you can you know, like a lot of uh, there's a good few garages around the place that will steam clean the bottom of boats, uh, or sometimes you just want to let them dry for a couple of months. Ideally, both because beyond uh, aquatic invasives like different different weeds like the curly leaved pygmy weed or New Zealand pygmy weed or what have you. There's also the the crayfish plague, which is um, it's a fungal pathogen I think that's uh, causing huge problems for the white clawed crayfish in Ireland, that's a, it's a native, and um, 
you've probably seen signs for pearl muscle or, or, or not pearl muscle, zebra muscle or quagga muscle that are the invasives that uh, disrupt our native freshwater pearl mussel and they can put their spores, both the, the plague and the mussel can have spores in the water that end up on the boat and you move a boat from one lake to another lake and it kind of takes off but beyond that we'll, we'll, we'll move on, I mean, I'm not going to get into all the different aquatic uh, aquatic weeds um, so yeah, so what, what can we do actually um, in, in, terms of, in terms of dealing with our invasive species some people say eat them there's a whole community of invasivores out there. It's like, I oh, you know, just eat all the invasives. And you can eat a lot of them. The one in this picture is the tricornered leek. It is an allium, so very similar to uh, wild garlic you see around the place in spring and summer. It smells the exact same, makes a great pesto. You can even eat uh, Japanese knotweed. It's like a more sour rhubarb. Um, but again, it is illegal to, to, uh, to aid the spread of these at all, to, to cut them, so unfortunately we can't start chomping into the Japanese nutweed. So the best thing you can do is, is report sightings of invasive species um, to the local authority being the, the county council. Um, alternatively, there are uh, you, you can log them on the Biodiversity Ireland's data centre. There's an app, and um, if you want more info on that, send me an email. Um, and anyone can just input not even invasive species, but any species you see around the place. You just pop it in, becomes a data point on a map. Um, and so that if you if you if you bring this up with your local authority, they will uh, ideally come in and, and try and sort it out for you. Um, and at this stage, it is it's control versus eradication. We're not going to get rid of all of them. We're, it's it's just going to be management. But look, like I said earlier, like prevention is is better than the cure in terms of best practice. So for hiking, for example. When you're out and about, knock your boots every so often um, in case there's any little bits of plant material or seeds stuck up into the grips. Um, wash your boots when you get home, like cleaning your boat between moving it between water courses. Um, give your boots a little clean when you get home. Um, and avoid avoid walking into streams or, or rivers when you're out hiking. Because again, you could have a little bit of plant material up in your boots gets into the stream and like Himalayan balsam or Japanese knotweed or giant rhubarb it moves down the stream, puts in its roots and it all happens again. Some, some final thoughts uh, before we wrap things up. Is this just ecology in action? I mean species do spread all the time, you do get natural extinctions, you know, species do get displaced. I suppose the problem here is that uh, humans are, are uh, an influence here, you know, we're the ones spreading them. But in a way, we're an animal too, so it's kind of like a you know, animal animals spreading plants around. It's it's not new, um, although it, it's happening faster than nature can can cope with. And so that's how it brings you back to the whole like chemical competition from um, the Himalayan balsam. But look, these these plants aren't the enemy. You know, they're not to be hated or to be feared. They're they're victims of circumstance. You know, we are the one that spread them. We're the one that introduced them, and. And they're, they're often quite beautiful because they're introduced for ornamental reasons. Like, okay, rhododendron might be a bit of a pain, but it's gorgeous. And even Japanese knotweed. I mean, if you see the flowers in the summer, they're, they're beautiful. Um, and it's kind of a pot calling the kettle black situation because who's the real invasive species here? You know, We're an ape that started in the Afar region in Africa. And now we're, we're everywhere, you know, we're, we're, we make up less than... We're one in a trillion species on the planet. And we're having huge impacts in every in every aspect, but that is uh, perhaps another talk for another time. So look, thank you very much for listening. Um, my email is here. It's Chris at flynnfernie.com. If you want any more information, any, any reading material, or if you have any questions, um, please just send me an email, and I'll be happy to get back to you.